Let's talk about the IBM RS6000, which is a server that I'm restoring and going to add to my home lab. And so the RS6000 is kind of a cool machine. I actually have uh, two of them here. Uh, it's a machine made by IBM in the 1990s, like early 1991, 92. And it was really the first machine that IBM introduced for their new power architecture, which was their own CPU. Um, and these two machines I bought off Facebook Marketplace. Uh, the person that had them used them as table ends for the last maybe 20 years. Uh, and so they had been turned on <laughs> in over 20 years. Uh, and it happens to be that these two models, they're both model 7056s, or sorry, 7013s. Um, and this one down here is a 530, which is one of the very early machines like maybe sometime in 1990 um, and then the second one here is a 570 which is a slightly more advanced machine the 530 is power one which is the very first of their power architecture cpus uh, and this uh, 570 is power one plus so a slightly faster version of the power one architecture um, it's an interesting machine you know these these physical chassis are really quite amazing they're uh they're this cast aluminum the entire chassis is it's like a single piece it's really quite amazing um construction um and even the older one uh is really quite a beautiful like a physical chassis it's just really interesting and, and certainly very 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 expensive um the machines themselves are sort of organized into two halves this side is sort of the compute half and there's a little door that opens up here and you can see the original ibm th this is the power one cpu and so for Power One and Power One Plus, uh, the CPU was not in a single chip. It was multiple chips that all worked together. This ends up being like a 12 layer board um, with a ton of interconnects. Um, eventually they compressed it down to less chips, um, but they were always taking advantage of having more than one um, integrated circuit for implementing the architecture. And so this is the Power One Plus, which I think is 33 megahertz, I believe. Uh, and then the memory is on this side here. And they have these little memory cards that slide in there, a total of eight slots there that support these memory cards. Um, and the memory cards themselves are kind of interesting. I have one here. Let's see here. Um, you know, they have these 72 pin SIMs that look like they're standard SIMs, but of course it's IBM, so they're not. They're a custom layout and a custom SIM. Um, you'll notice they have 10 chips because it has a 40 bit ECC. And then these chips here, which are three of these chips here that are IBM custom chips, do all the memory controlling and ECC memory check. So obviously it's designed to be super high quality and, and variable reliable memory. Um, and the boards go anywhere from 32. I think there's, there was actually uh, a 128 megabyte board at some point, but those are pretty expensive. Um, and so this machine has three cards in it that are uh, 32 megabytes per card. Um, and so this you know, gives you a total of 128 megabytes, um, which in 1991 would have been a, uh, a significant amount of uh, memory. And the chassis is kind of interesting in that the top part here is the CPU and the memory. And then there's a little set of connectors here that connect to the lower board, which is a separate board that can be replaced separately. Um, and when IBM introduced the R6000, they also used it as one of the platforms for their microchannel architecture, which are these slots here. And microchannel was meant to be sort of the next evolution of the card slot for um, the PC chassis. And I think, you know, if you over here, I think I have a, on the wall there is an original IBM XT, an original IBM PC motherboard with the ISA slots. Uh, and of course the ISA slots, uh, kind of defined that uh, industry. And there's always this question of, well, what's next after the ISA slot? And there was, of course, the ESA slot, which was, at the time of this coming out, was kind of catching on. Um, and IBM wanted to make their own a little more proprietary thing. And I think they thought that they could do this and have it catch on. And it most certainly did not. It sort of failed miserably. Um, it was available in both this chassis for all the R6000s, plus in the original IBM PS2. Um, and so there are not a ton of market shop architecture cards out there. Most are made by IBM. There are a few others, but it really did not uh, end up taking over very well. It got beat out by a combination of just the wide proliferation of ISA, um, plus eventually AGP and VLBus, and then eventually PCI really kind of 
uh, took over that marketplace of what the next, next expansion bus would be. So it's kind of a funny machine. This lower board also has um, a SCSI controller on it and a floppy controller um, and some serial and parallel IO plus a little mouse and tablet and uh, keyboard controller um, that connect on the other side. And then the lower part of the case is where the hard drives are mounted. This has two of those um, three and a half inch uh, sort of three quarter height uh, hard drives that are SCSI. Um, and then on the other side of the machine, uh, it has the power supply, which is a honking big power supply. Um, and then little bays here for extra devices. So it has a, um, a floppy drive and a CD-ROM. There's actually a tape drive. I have one of the tape drives that came with it as well. Uh, and so you can have those connect separately. And then on the back side here, um, there is a, a serial port, a couple serial ports, a parallel port, and these keyboard, mouse, and tablet uh, ports. But there are some weird things. So um, on the 530, it's a very similar layout. Uh, that one, when I cleaned it up, and both machines came really, really dirty in terms of dust, but no other damage. And so I was able to take them apart and fully clean all the PCBs um, and reassemble. And the 530, the power supply does not work. And I have the power supply sitting over here. Um, and I did take it apart. And it's a relatively complicated power supply. Um, I mean, especially for the time. It has an internal rail that converts, I think, the AC up to, I think, 350 volts DC and then a bunch of down converters. Um, and a bunch of logic, there's probably four microcontrollers in there, so it's a somewhat complicated power supply. Um, and it might be possible on this 530 to replace it with an ATX power supply. And I say that because that power supply, the outputs are only 5 volts and 12 volts, plus and minus. Um, and there may be one data connection, which I have not yet debugged, but it may be possible to use an ATX power supply uh, that could provide those uh, power rails and have the system uh, work. This, this power supply is only hooked up via those connectors there that go into the main board. And in looking at the, the manual for these boards, the very early ones only use the 5 and the 12 volt. Um, the later ones, like this 570, would be more difficult to do that with because the power supply um, outputs not only 5 volt and 12 volt, but also um, 3.7 volts. And in looking that 3.7 volts is used on the board, I think maybe it's rectified down to 3.3. Um, so you'd have to have a power supply that can do all of those different power supply um, voltages. The second thing is that on both these machines, the only way you know that something's happening is this, this little postcode display, which is a little three digit seven segment display, and it's on both of them. And it shows codes while it's booting, telling you like it's testing the power supply and testing different things. And in this newer one, this circuitry is connected directly to a bunch of logic inside of here. So I suspect that would be a little harder to replicate without a lot of debugging. On the older 530, it may be a simpler setup. There isn't as many data lines going from the power supply um, to that display. So that'll be another project where I'll see if it's possible. It may be possible to repair that power supply, but it's an exceptionally complicated power supply, and I haven't been able to find any schematics for it, so that may be... Um, a bit of a challenge, but the 570 power supply uh, does work, even though it hadn't been turned on in, in 20 years. Um, and so I was able to get this sort of powered up and start figuring out what works and what doesn't work. Uh, both the hard drives made funny noises, uh, not surprising for a 25 year old machine, uh, but I did end up finding another SCSI drive I had laying around. It was an, an old Apple uh, drive that is SCSI and I put that in and got the CD-ROM working. And on the front here, there's a little switch that is for normal, secure, and service. And if it's in normal mode, then it'll look for a hard drive to boot from. If you have it in service, it'll look for a boot media that contains either installation or diagnostic. Um, and so that was easy to do. I put it in service, put in an AX 4.1 uh, uh, install CD, and I was able to get it to boot up and run the uh, installer. So a couple of interesting things about trying to install on this machine. Uh, there is that serial port in the back, which I connected to a little machine here with a serial port on it. Um, and when you power the machine on, there's nothing on the serial port. It doesn't output any BIOS or even telling you the machine's alive until it boots the AX media. And then eventually the installer sends out something to all of the serial ports saying, hey, if this is the serial port you wanna do the install from type one and press enter, 
And once you do that, then it uses that serial port as sort of the console serial port. And so I was able to do that, run the installer. The installer could uh, see the hard drive that was installed. Um, and you know, after 35, 40 minutes, I was able to get it to install uh, a version of AX4 and uh, reboot. And it, and it mentioned, you know, during install to turn the switch back to normal. And once it finished installing, it would automatically reboot. And so it rebooted, and then out of the serial port, you could see messages coming from the kernel as it booted AIX, and then it just kind of stopped after maybe a minute or so of, of loading things. Uh, and it turns out quite interestingly that the when AIX spawns the get TTY, which is the thing that produces the login prompt on the serial ports, uh, it looks for the serial port to have the carry detect and the DTR pins both asserted. And I was just using a normal three pin connection. And so I modified this little housing here to connect the DSR to the DTR and the carry detect. That way when AX initialized the port, it would set that DSR. Um, and that would then in turn set the DTR and the CD. And sure enough, as soon as I plugged it in with that uh, wire connected, you could hear the hard drive access and it popped up a login prompt. Um, and so if you're going to restore one of these, keep in mind you have to have those signals either connected to your terminal or connected so they'll be asserted. Um, so it will launch a uh, terminal on the machine. I was then able to log into AIX and, and had a fully functioning uh, system on a very old hard drive. And of course, to make this something be a little more reliable, I wanted to replace that old hard drive. And so I eventually ended up installing a, um, a Zulu SCSI, which is a little... SCSI emulator board. These are super popular in sort of the retro computing world uh, because they emulate SCSI and so it emulates both the hard drive and the CD-ROM with all the install media. Um, and it does that with a little SD card as the sort of backing image of that. Um, and it was relatively easy to get this to work on this machine. Um, I even made a little custom a 3D printed bracket that uh, makes it so that it mounts on the back here and you can get to the SD card from the, uh, the back. There was one weird thing about the SCSI that I think is really good to know. It's IBM, so there's always something. Uh, the SCSI cable that is included, let me see here where you can see it. Uh, it had this wire running along the back side of it, taped from the very connector all the way through to the back of the machine. And on the back of the machine, uh, there was a port here and it had this terminator installed. And this is one of the terminators from IBM that had their own little termination is called perfect termination. And you know, in digging around the data sheets, most of those perfect terminators used like a 2.7 volt sort of central reference power um, as opposed to five volt. And sure enough, what IBM did was is that on this SCSI connector here, they used pin one and keep in mind on SCSI, all of the odd pins are ground. So they're all connected together typically. But in this one, they made pin one a separate 2.7 volt power supply. And so this little patch was a wire that ran along the whole length of the cable that connected pin one here to the terminator power pin just on this back connector here. Uh, and so if you just take and put in a normal SCSI cable, and I wanted to replace the cable with a shorter cable, I didn't need so many connectors, uh, the machine wouldn't even boot at all. Um, and so once I figured that I was able to cut trace one on there um, so that it wouldn't short that to ground, um, install the blue SCSI and everything works fine. But if you end up working in one of these machines, keep an eye out for that. I think they use that uh, perfect termination stuff in a number of the IBM machines. And so being able to determine where that power comes from um, is uh, valuable. Uh, and so after that, I was able to get a network card installed, um, microchannel. This one is actually a somewhat more advanced card in that it's a 10 megabit and 100 megabit card. Um, and the drivers for this were not included in AX 4.2, but I was able to download the drivers on a floppy image and eventually get them loaded and got that up and working. So I now have uh, working networking so I can tell that into the machine and, and uh, run and install utilities and all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, I do have a few other cards that came with the machine. Um, this is the original uh, 10 megabit network card, the 3Com, which is a somewhat popular one in these machines, 10 megabit Ethernet, um, and then a couple of uh, SCSI adapters that were IBM built SCSI adapters. Interesting, it's an 8186 CPU for the ROM there. Um, it did have one graphics card, which is this IBM monochrome graphics card that was one of the very early ones. It wasn't very popular. The connector's VGA and the signals are sort of VGA compatible. 
Um, I haven't gotten a driver to work on this yet, but I suspect I should be able to get it to work. And a, likely a modern LCD monitor with VG input will be able to sync to the, uh, to the signal coming out of that. And then of course it had uh, these token ring cards, which are super common in the IBM world. And so there's a bunch of those uh, sitting there ready to do something. Uh, so the machine is now uh, up and uh, functional, and I'm going to go put it into my home lab uh, somewhere, and I'll be able to run some cool jobs on this extremely powerful machine. Keep in mind, it's only like 33 megahertz, you know, single power one CPU. Uh, but it is kind of just a fun machine, I w <clears throat> and I was interested in restoring it and getting it running. Uh, when I was at Purdue, we had one of these machines. It was named Buckeye, and it was a machine that IBM had donated to us in our, um, in the parallel processing lab, and I always had fond memories of that, so it was cool to be able to get one of these. They called them desk side computers, um, and in some ways maybe surprised that I was able to get it up and running and installed and booting. Um, there's still lots of work to do on the software side. I need to get a version of DCC so I can build some other tools for it. It is possible to install AIX5 on this machine, um, which would have been newer, it came out after the machine came out, uh, but it would be pretty slow, and I might give that a try. Um, it just probably would need more memory. Um, one other thing that's kind of funny is it did have these batteries here, um, and there's one from the other machine. It's a little lithium uh, battery from IBM, and uh, you know this is the original one from the machine, and amazingly, it still reads like 2.7 or 2.8 volts. Um, and it's a three-volt lithium battery, you know, from 1990 something, 91, 92. Uh, and the good thing is these don't leak, being the lithium batteries. So there's no risk of a battery leaking and corroding everything on the chassis, which is always a potential problem um, with old machines. So, so I'm going to continue to work on this a little bit and see if I can get it all maybe put back together and uh, installed in the home lab.